All right, we're ready to begin. Thank you, Joshua. And we'd like, uh, we'd like to welcome our PTAC clients and other businesses and uh, perhaps other, individu and, uh, other individuals from other organizations this morning who are joining the uh, Procurement Technical Assistance Center's outreach. Today, we are most fortunate to have Amelia Valesco, and she is with the U.S. Forest Service, and she offices up at uh, up in Idaho Falls, uh, but Utah is one of her uh, states uh, in her region. But before we get to Amelia, again, I'd like to welcome our PTAC clients, as well as other businesses who are joining us. And for those of you who are not PTAC clients, but have received this invitation, welcome. I'd like to take just a couple of minutes to explain uh, a little bit about uh, what PTAC is and what we do. Uh, PTAC is, uh, is part of the Governor's Office of Economic Development, and we are also a program that is affiliated with the uh, Defense Logistics Agency, and they are a division with the uh, Department of Defense. And what PTAC does is assist Utah businesses with government contracting at all levels, whether that be at the Department of Defense, federal agencies, state and local agencies, right down to school districts, colleges, and universities. We will help you get the necessary registrations, help you find the bid opportunities, help you respond to an RFP or an RFQ, uh, as well as post award administration. So we do all things uh, government contracting. So that's a little, a little bit about PTAC. If you'd like to learn more, we'd like to invite you to uh, go to our website, which is found at business.utah.gov forward slash PTAC, P-T-A-C. Let me uh, repeat that again. Our website is found at business.utah.gov gov forward slash PTAC. And there you'll find everything that uh, PTAC uh, uh, does and where we're located. We have eight regional managers uh, that covers the state. So no matter where you are today that uh, in, in joining us, uh, we, we have you covered. Uh, we don't have an office in every single of the 29 counties, but all 29 counties are covered by these eight regional managers. And speaking of regional managers, uh, I am pleased to uh, introduce our newest regional manager who literally joined us just yesterday. His name is Chris Herrera. And Chris, join, uh, Chris is joining us and Chris covers the uh, Davis, Weber and Morgan County area. He offices out of Kaysville, Utah. So uh, clients and those who might uh, be uh, situated in those three counties. I'd like to introduce you to Chris Herrera. Chris, would you like to introduce yourself, please? Sure, Chuck. Yeah, thanks for the introduction, Chuck. Um, my name is Chris Herrera. I just started yesterday. Um, it's great to meet everybody, and um, I'm really thankful for this opportunity. Um, some of my background, I was a cost price analyst and an ACO yeah, as a civil service employee, and I was also, I'm a lieutenant commander in the Navy Reserves, so I have a military background. I've been in the military for the past 20 years. Um, I went to the University of Utah, did a bachelor's in business finance, and then I did my MBA at Westminster, so it's pretty nice to be home back in Utah. Um, I'm still getting acclimated, getting access to a lot of the systems I need, and cell phones, um, but I anticipate being up and running probably by the end of the year. I look forward to meeting everybody. And uh, again, I am just uh, thankful for the opportunity. And um, if anything, please reach out. And I'm always here to help. Thank you very much, Chris. So we encourage, uh, oh, Chris, would you mind sharing your uh, email address with your uh, clients? Sure. Um, it's C, and then my last name, Herrera. So just C H E R R E R A at utah.gov. Thank you. We encourage uh, uh, clients in that area as well as uh, businesses who want to receive PTAC services in those three counties to reach out to Chris and he will be more than happy to help you. Uh, uh, because of his background, he, uh, he's well versed in government contracting and will be able to assist you uh, right from the get go. 
So uh, without further ado, it's my privilege to introduce our, uh, our presenter today, uh, Amelia Valesco with the Forest Service. Amelia started uh, uh, her career with the Forest Service in 2006 as an office automation clerk. Then she was later given an opportunity to participate in the Student Career Experience Program as, as a contracting officer trainee. She received a bachelor's degree in business management from Idaho State University. Then she was appointed as a contracting officer and has remained in that position to the present time. Amelia also supports the fire season as a procurement lead uh, excuse me, as a procurement unit leader. So we are most fortunate to have Amelia today. And by the way, she will be talking about uh, how to do business with the Forest Service, uh, the services, uh, construction, and supplies that they are looking for. So pay uh, close attention because these are real live opportunities for Utah businesses, uh, especially as uh, the Forest Service has these types of needs in the state of Utah. So without further ado, we turn the time over to Amelia. Amelia? Thank you, Josh. I look forward to working with all of you. Um, I am here to discuss, as the screen says, doing business with the Forest Service. Um, in the years past, I've always worked with the Idaho and the Wyoming PTAC, so I'm grateful to be given this opportunity to present for the Utah PTAC this year. Um, so moving into it, um, I just want to make sure you guys understand um, how our how the United States is broken up into the contracting world because our contracting offices are spread throughout the United States, but we are um, broken out into zones. So you'll see um, Idaho, Utah is included into the Intermountain Zone. So I'm located physically in Idaho Falls, Idaho, um, and we cover the entire Intermountain Zone. Um, and I specifically am a contracting officer for construction and architect and engineering type contracts. Um, so all of our service and supply are done by a different contracting group. Um, but we will get into all of that um, contact information. If there's a specific type of contract that you guys are interested in, um, we can get into the contact information at the end of the presentation. But this is just to give you guys an idea if you're wanting to target a specific area beyond Utah. Um, just understand that we are broken out and we are zoned, um, and this is how we're zoned. So um, just to give you guys an idea of a variety of different service type contracts that um, the Forest Service is seeking, um, this list is not all inclusive, as you guys know, um, but it's just to give you an idea of most of our annual services that we are seeking. Um, and I think janitorial, for our rural areas, because within each state, um, we have multiple national forests. And then with each, within each national forest, we have multiple ranger district offices. So each ranger district office has to have janitorial services, especially with COVID. And so it, this year, um, it seems like we've had an increased um, demand in the type of janitorial services that we're seeking. But again, this is just to give you guys an idea of the type of services um, that we are needing a contractor to fulfill for us. And each ranger district office is usually located in a very rural area. And um, there's times where we're even janitorial services, it's very hard for us to get competition because they might be in a very rural small town that we might not have that many federal um, or qualified contractors to work with. So um, this is to give you guys an idea of all variety of different construction projects that we've done. Um, and just keep in mind the difference between construction and service, because sometimes service contracts can apply um, with paint, you know, with us getting paint jobs done or, or a variety of different things. The difference between service and construction is when it's a real piece of property um, that can't be moved, that we need those services done. And generally that's under construction. And we can kind of get more into defining, um, our, the federal acquisition regulations do define the difference between a service and construction as well. And so if you guys need assistance with um, knowing the difference, because the biggest issue here I want you guys to understand is the wage determination that the Department of Labor um, in any state requires 
contractors to pay their employees. And so the difference between a service and a construction is under the service, anything beyond $2,500, if you're contracted um, for work that's greater than 2,500 in a service project, that then requires the service contract wage determination to apply. But with construction, anything greater than $2,000, you will then have to abide by the Davis-Bacon wages. And again, these are all wage determinations that would be incorporated in the solicitation. Um, so you would very well know before you bid on a project what those wages are. But just so you guys know the difference between the two, because that's critical. Um, the next type of solicitation that we do are for supplies. Um, we don't have any kind of um, shop or warehouse that we produce any of our own products. Um, so we do contract a lot of that out. And so this is to give you guys an, a list. Again, just an idea. It's not all inclusive, but a, a list of the type of products um, that we do purchase. And at any time, you guys may be asking yourself, so where could we find, you know, projects that may be coming up? And I like to call this the very first website we provide here is the procurement forecast website. And that's more of our engineer, um, any ologists like our biologists or hydrologists, that's essentially their wish list is what that is. So you guys can find um, any of the acquisitions that we're anticipating to um, solicit on that website. Uh, do understand though that um, this is just a forecast. And so there are some on this list that may or may not necessarily be awarded or solicited. Um, a big chunk um, and a reason why you guys have probably never heard of me um, other than this year is because of the Great American Outdoors Act. We're anticipating um, additional funding from coming and this next slide will kind of go more in depth and give you guys a summary um, of what this act really includes. But do understand the result and I guess the bottom line um, of this act is that us as a forest service will um, within the next five years have funding that needs to be spent. And so we're gonna be looking in all directions to ensure that we can meet the goals that are given to us um, to spend this fund within the amount of time that we have. So I'm not gonna read you guys a slide. I'll very well make sure that you guys get a copy of the presentation and even for the websites that we provided because there is a lot of additional information. I don't want you guys to feel overwhelmed. And like I said, really at the bottom line, it comes down to um, federal agencies getting a bulk of money um, within a specific amount of time that we have to obligate these funds. And so there is a criteria that each project needs to meet in order for us to solicit and use the Great American Door Act funds. Um, we can't just use these funds for anything. They have to meet a specific criteria. And so this is in a summary to give you guys an idea of how a project or why a project would be solicited because it meets this criteria that's identified here. Because like I said, the website I provided to you guys, it is a lot of information to take in um, and some of it may or may not apply to a specific project that you're looking into. Um, but here we're just trying to encompass and summarize for you guys. So um, just so you guys know, um, our government estimates are um, generated by our boots on the ground um, and they essentially tell us as contracting officers how much they're anticipating spending. So if you see a project um, and you're not wanting to go much bigger but you see it, you're interested in it, it's less than 25,000, you'll probably be seeing it on the Beta SAM website. With the construction projects, we can disclose a range of what that, pro that project will fall um, with service and supply, we can't provide a range of where our government estimate is at. Um, but if you know on this website, if you work with um, the PTAC centers, most of them are aware of all the websites that we advertise um, our solicitations. And this specific website is where we post uh, projects that are less than 25, uh, but greater than 15,000, because we are required by our federal acquisitions law to um, ensure that we are publicizing projects within the $15,000 to $25,000 range. So you may wonder what happens with those projects less than 15,000. It's on the discretion of the contracting officer or the purchasing agent of how they wanna advertise that project. Um, they very well can choose to um, publicize that just in their local office. Like if, for example, if it's a janitorial service and they're looking for someone close 
um, and they're not wanting them to have to travel a significant amount of time just to clean once a week, um, they may just have that solicitation there at the district office. Um, but that's just to give you guys an example. Again, um, 15 to 25,000 is what our regulations require. Um, but if we are seeking national competition, then we may very well proceed with publicizing it on the Beta SAM website, which is where we are required to post all of our projects that are greater than $25,000. So if our government estimate is greater than 25, you guys will find it on this Beta SAM website. Um, again, please do know though, at the same time, the contracting officer has that discretion of how far and why they would like to solicit their project. So this is the government wide point of entry. And uh, this government wide point of entry is essentially where all uh, federal agencies are required to um, post their projects. So it's not just the Forest Service, this is government wide where all federal agencies are required to issue or post um, because it is required that we compete every project. Um, as you guys know, it is our taxpayer money um, that we are using, it is appropriated funds. And so for that reason, we do have to compete all of our projects. Do know there's exceptions and I'm gonna get into those. <laughs> um, so the next thing is the system for award management. So if you guys do not already know what a DUNS number is, if you do not know what SAM is, make sure you're in contact with PTAC because me as a contracting officer, I would love to, to spend some time and discuss and get into helping you with setting up your profile. But as a contracting officer, again, that would not be fair since I wouldn't have time to help all of my small businesses that I work with. And so for that reason, I'm very grateful to work with PTAC because they are somewhat the middleman between me and the small business. They will assist you guys in multiple ways. And this is one, um, but do know when you're registered in SAM and you are active in SAM, it does not necessarily mean that you are guaranteed a, a government contract. Again, this is just showing me that you guys are qualified um, to seek or to be awarded a government contract. Um, I think they're hitting this hard more and more, especially now with even fire season. I know that there are some emergencies where contractors come to us and say, hey, I have a piece of equipment right here. We can help you guys out on the fire line. We can do all these things for you, but we are now, um, getting to the point where there's times um, where there are no exceptions. Um, and if we have the fire what somewhat contained, we then are required to still have that um, contractor be in SAM. And the reason now that I think they're getting harder and harder on this with us is because SAM is one of those things that you have to go through an IRS consent. And way back 15 years ago, when I first started with the Forest Service as a contracting officer trainee, that was something that we seen a lot of, that we would award a contract to a contractor not knowing that they failed the IRS consent because there, it was very hard for us to get a timely report from the IRS to show who was on that report and who was deficient. So that for that reason, now they're a lot quicker electronically, of course, um, through SAM. And that's why it's required that you are active as a small business to show us that you um, are qualified to receive a federal contract. So some exceptions to how we can um, go about, and um, there's times where our contracts, it's not in the best interest of that specific procurement for us to go national and compete it at a national level. Um, like I was saying, the Beta SAM website is where we have to advertise most of our, all of our solicitations with a few exceptions. And this list right here is, are the exceptions of when we can set projects aside for specific type of businesses. So some of you may have your 8A certification. Some of you may be located in a hub zone area, or um, some of you may be a woman-owned business or service disabled vet. And all of those, there would be a specific type of certification um, that you would have to demonstrate to us as the government that you are qualified as one of these um, type of businesses. And in that situation, the contracting officer can make the determination to set the specific project aside for just those small businesses located in a specific hub zone area or for just you know veteran owned businesses. So then you'd have to present that certification to prove that you are the type of company that can um, compete on the project. So again, these set asides meaning that we are spe we're specifically identifying a project for only certain type of companies. 
So if you guys have any questions, I know even the Small Business Administration and PTAC are good resources to be in contact with if you have any questions regarding how to become, you know, an 8A certified company or how to get a procurement set aside for your type of company. Do know that 8A um, is a big one when at the very end of the year where we're getting a lot of funding um, and they're saying, you know, we're going to be losing these funds at the end of the fiscal year. So if we don't spend them, we lose them. And so there's times where we are up against a wall and trying to procure something quickly. And um, we can sole source uh, procurements if they're 8A certified. So there are very few exceptions to sole sourcing work within the government. Um, and that is one of the exceptions is an 8A sole source. So again, if you guys are interested in knowing um, how to become certified or what requirements you have to meet, be sure to utilize those free resources available to you. Um, so now that you found a project that you are interested in and um, that you would like to provide us a, pr a, a proposal on, um, do know that there are not only contracting officers like myself, but there are purchasing agents out there that can solicit projects. Um, and an RFQ is a request for quote and an RFP is a request for proposal. And that's why we have a slash there because generally quotes, we can issue solicitations uh, for a request for quote for anything less than $250,000. Anything greater than $250,000, generally we would like a write-up. We would like to see an actual full-blown proposal of you addressing specific evaluation criteria. Um, so as you can see, the first two bullet points are is essentially identical. They're saying the same thing, just to read the solicitation because there are multiple times where I know there's a contractor that can do specific work for me because back in my training days, I know he was awarded a contract. I know we worked with him before and I know he has done amazing work on the forest, but yet he hasn't taken the time to read it. And it is noticeable in, in the write-ups um, and just understanding what's required of you because in the evaluation, um, generally with RFQs, we are really only seeking past performance. We just want to know that you've satisfied your customers in the past and that sometimes depending on the complexity of the project is sufficient enough for us to understand um, that their price and their past performance is really the only two things we can choose to evaluate. But understanding what is required of you to furnish to us um, is, is very critical. And, and decide not only is it something that I can, I can get some crews out there, I can get them working on this project, but can you do it successfully? Because I know that there are some there's many factors that you guys have to take into consideration when preparing for a project, but I know that there are some projects trying or small businesses trying to grow. Um, and sometimes they look at projects as, okay, this is a project that we can do, but how well can you do it? And so just keep in mind those past performances, generally a, a performance or an evaluation factor that we are always, always looking for to evaluate. Um, so when you're actually writing your proposal, there are times to know it's all based on complexity. So the purchasing agent or the contracting officer can determine under even an RFQ, they can say price is not as important as past performance, or they can say uh, delivery date, even if it's a simple supply, they can say delivery date is significantly more important than price. That means it's not coming down to price, even if it's a request for quote, they can take it beyond that. And again, that's why you need to make sure you're looking at your evaluation criteria, you're, pay you're paying attention to specific sessions of the, of the solicitation. For example, section L and section M of the solicitation are two sections that generally will address, are they doing at best value? Meaning are they not just looking at price? What are they looking? What is a significant, a significantly more important um, or the more important factor that I need to be considering. Is it really price? Because I think a lot of people, it's a misconception that we are coming down to price. Essentially, at the end of the day, we are seeking the best value for the government. Um, so again, start by addressing your valuation factors. Make sure that you're, you're understanding what, what they're really going to evaluate you on and make it clear that you understand that. Um, like I said, I, I've, I've seen people's work on the ground. I've known a specific company to do a work or a project that I'm looking at. Um, but then when I see them actually on paper, it doesn't seem that they really understand what we're needing. There's times where I see them kind of mimic what's in the solicitation. They basically just kind of paraphrase it, you know, make basically take most of the words from the solicitation and kind of 
make it their own, but they're not necessarily showing us that they understand. Um, so that's crucial. And just be very specific, as, as specific as you can to show that you have put your time and effort in addressing the solicitation. And just making sure that you're always keeping our needs um, or know that, you know, keep the agency's needs when in mind when you're writing the, the proposal as well. So just some common errors that we've seen um, and common errors that not only me, so I'm not the only contracting officer that actually put this uh, PowerPoint presentation together. There was multiple. And one of the purpose of this slide was because we wanna make sure the simplest things, um, the due date and time is a huge one where contractors will still come and say, hey, you know, here's the write-up and, and, and they've missed the, the due date, you know, by two days or even, um, being on mountain time zone and, you know, even the time zones, um, sometimes you, you miss it within an hour or two, you miss that um, due date. So just pay attention to those. Um, I know if you're just monitoring the beta, Sam, if you have PTAC on your side and at, you are a client of theirs, they will continue to monitor websites for you, but make sure if you are um, interested in one specific solicitation that you're taking in consideration those amendments. Cause at any time, even the due date um, on that day that that solicitation or that you know proposal is due, the contracting officer could always change that by amending the solicitation. So you always want to continue to monitor the website all the way up until the solicitation closing date and time to ensure you have not missed any amendments. And sometimes they're very simple amendments that all they need is your signature at the very bottom of the amendment saying that you have uh, acknowledge the information that's in the amendment that you've you understand it is a change that we are implementing and that has not affected your price or if it has make make the appropriate edits um that's the whole reason for the amendments and um so just make sure that you're you're keeping those in mind as well because if there are amendments that have not been acknowledged meaning even signed um there's nothing that we can do to consider your business further there's times where we have to consider you non-responsive and that depends on how important that amendment is if it was a simple um we're eliminating you know a portion of the um evaluation factors saying that we're you know changing the evaluation factors or whatever the case is where it may not affect your price it may not affect you know other things but um it's still important for you to make sure that you're acknowledging all those amendments. And just make sure that you review it for mathematical errors. I think there's times where we received um, just a, the, you know, a dollar amount um, where they've kind of carried out the cents you know, to the fifth or sixth decimal point, which we don't necessarily need. So make sure that you're, you're looking at the schedule of items and that you're acknowledging and preventing any mathematical errors. Um, and verifying that you've signed it, that's that's an important thing. Um, even the instructions of offers. So I was mentioning section L, section M. There are um, specific instructions that can help you guide, um, guide you through the solicitation on how to respond. Um, so just make sure, like I said, that you're, you're reading the solicitation, you understand what's in there and um, that you're following those instructions. And like I said, PTAC, I will always be a cheerleader of them because they are very helpful. <laughs> if I was a small business, I would definitely be utilizing them for sure. So um, this one, I think at the bottom, at, at the end of the day, at the bottom line um, that we want you guys to understand is the successful proposals are not necessarily just those that are responding. Like I was mentioning the valuation factors, it's good for you to acknowledge even past performance. There's times where People will tell us, um, well, I don't have any past performance. That's why I didn't provide you. Like my, my business is expanding in that area, but I don't have any specific experience in what you're looking for. So I couldn't give you three to five years of past performance because I don't have it. And in that situation, my recommendation would, would be to not just ignore that past performance evaluation factor because it's still there. At least do a write-up to say, my business has no experience, at least addressing that evaluation factor is my recommendation. Um, and just let us know that same exact thing that you're expanding in that area or your business is shifting and what its you know, mission is. And, and for that reason, you guys don't have past performance. So just explaining that to us will put you in a neutral rating rather than a non-responsive rating, if that makes sense. So again, part of that is kind of convincing us, convincing us that you can 
do this project. Um, so make sure that you are, um, because I, I, even all the other mentors throughout my career um, that I've had of, of contracting officers, they have to be convinced. If they're not, they're not going to feel comfortable with putting their name on a contract um, and signing and awarding um, and obligating funds to a, a small business if they're not convinced that that business can do that work. So um, here is, I don't know why it says Idaho at the top, because you guys will see, um, like, no, our regional office, there's specific um, forests that are listed on here for service and supply. And for some reason, well, a construction and architect and engineering. So that's my supervisor is Christina. Um, and we actually cover the entire Intermountain Zone. So it's not just the state of Utah, but at least letting us know what states you are willing to travel in or work in. I know construction is a little bit harder because you do have to have certain permits and licenses, um, but this is kind of the breakout um, for the Intermountain Zone. The emergency incident kind of goes nationwide and Ron Schultz um, is a good contact, even if you say, I'm only interested in working in the specific um, state. Ron very well can let you know um, what other you know, nationwide contracts, usually emergency when it comes to fire suppression or any kind of incident support that we provide. Um, those solicitations are generally advertised on the Viper website. And I know that PTAC is one of um, those resources that you can utilize if you want more information regarding how you get set up in Viper and what you need to do in Viper. Um, but do know that there are uh, dispatch centers in every um, at every supervisor office. So when you guys hear of a national forest, so for example, uh, the Caribou Targhee National Forest is located in Idle Falls. The supervisor office is located in Idle Falls. However, that forest has multiple ranger districts throughout this the state, and. Um, Ashton, Idaho, Island Park, you know, they're really small rural towns where the population is not very big. And so there's times where our boots on the ground located in Idaho, Island Park, Idaho. Um, that's just to give you guys an example, that district office may not know that you guys are out there. So my recommendation is number one, if you're, if you're interested in fire to go to your dispatch centers, your local dispatch centers. And if you don't know where your local dispatch center is, you can stop at any forest service office and they can let you know what the closest dispatch center is. Generally, um, like I know in Idle Falls, Idaho, the Caribou Targhee National Forest is actually hosted not only with BLM, but we're actually hosted with the East Idaho uh, Dispatch Center. Um, so just going to you know any forest service office closest to you um, and they very well could not only give you that information, but if you're not interested in fire and you're interested in just regular contract work, like even janitorial services, if you think that you can provide that office or you know you can provide that office some type of service or product, reach out to them because essentially what they do, they're the boots on the ground. My boots, I wish I could get out more often and on the field, but I unfortunately have to do it on my own time because um, in contracting, we're getting farther and farther away from the ground, unfortunately. Um, but my love for the forest has not stopped because I still go on my own time and go enjoy the forest. But my recommendation to you guys as small business owners would be to reach out to your local um, district offices. Again, the one closest to you, any a simple Google search in your city and state would let you know where the closest national forest office is at. And there is where you can send your capability statements because essentially they're the ones putting a list of interested vendors for me to look at. They're the ones that are boots on the ground so often that they know when there's a bridge in need, when there's a trail that has not uh, had attention for a while, or even if one of our biologists needs a specific type of tablet or a specific, you know, if, if there's any kind of supply or service that any of our ologists needs or any of our engineers or anyone on the ground, um, essentially they come to us in contracting. So if it's a supply type contract less or greater than $10,000, they'll bring to us and they'll say, here's the specifications that I need my product to meet. And they'll say, oh, guess what? I just met this, these companies. There's three of them um, that I know of that are actually close. So I know they could get it shipped to me pretty quickly. And those are times, obviously we wanna work with our, small, our local small businesses more than we want to outsource. Um, but sometimes it just, it comes up to what's on that piece of paper in front of us. If that Florida company showed us more that they, they convinced us that they can fulfill the, our need 
um, then we'll go with the Florida company. Again, it all, it all comes down to those proposals that's in front of us. So, but at least reaching out to your local district offices, letting them know you're out there, at least they can put your name on and include it in their contracting package. So when I, I receive it in my office, then I can say, okay, they do know of three locals that are out there. So I'm going to make sure that these locals get this, a copy of the solicitation and they let me know if they're interested. So um, that's just a couple of, you know, out of everything else I've talked about today, I hope that those, that at least that one thing that you guys will consider doing, um, you can very well send your capability statements to me as well, or to my supervisor. So if you guys see um, that you guys do more service supply, you can very well email it to Rebecca and Brian. Um, if you do more construction or architect and engineering work, you can email it to Christina. And then if you're interested in playing a little bit more into the incident world, because even right now, it's not just fire suppression um, that the Forest Service assists with. As an incident management team that I'm on as a procurement unit leader, we go out for everything. Even we are currently stationed and there's only a small group of us that are out, but there's currently um, 12 of, I think there's actually 50 of us on the team, but there's only 12 um, helping out right now with the COVID vaccine distribution team. So again, it's all incident. Um, it could be a tornado. It could be any kind of incident that's happening on a national um, that our national teams do go out and support any of those type of incidents. Um, so just so you guys know, when we say emergency incident, it's not just involving fire. Um, but those solicitations are out there. I know vehicle with driver is a huge one because essentially you just need a vehicle and a driver. <laughs> so those solicitations are out there. Um, I know that they are on a three-year rotation. So there are times where companies don't respond to the solicitation um, as soon as it's due. And so then that for that reason, they're out three they're usually out three years um, and they don't get another opportunity to um, you know, participate in the solicitation or be given the opportunity to uh, be awarded an emergency incident um, contract because they have to wait for those three years. So again, knowing the resources, knowing the point of contacts and where to go to ask the questions to um, is, is crucial. So I know I talked a lot. <laughs> it's probably a lot of information. Um, but I am also a resource and I know that PTAC can get you um, my contact information if there's something specific that you would like to ask, or we, I can ask or answer some questions now if you guys have any. any. Joshua, did we have any um, questions in the chat box? No, sir. Okay. Does anyone would like to just orally ask Amelia any questions at this time? Yeah, I, I have a, a quick question, Amelia. Thank you so much for all the information that you've provided. I really appreciate that. Yes, thank you. Um, I was, I, I'm wondering how, uh, is there a way that um, a consultant or other people can, can be intermediaries to help these small businesses uh, write the proposals? Is, is, is there a formal process for that? Generally, um, when you are going to be assisting small businesses with a service, because I know there are small, there are small businesses that are even helping with uh, registering for SAM or anything like that. And I, and I would highly recommend talking to PTAC because we don't necessarily solicit anything um, or create any contracts. Maybe Department of Defense does, but, um, we use we utilize our local state resources like PTAC um, to have you know contractors assist. So I don't know if maybe PTAC is um, soliciting projects, but generally us as a Forest Service, we don't put solicitations out for um, consultants to assist other small businesses. I see. Thank you. I appreciate that. Yeah. Thank you for calling in and joining. That's the question. Do we have any others? I just posted one on the chat. My question is, how do we go about seeing, uh, doing a FOIA request? Do we do it to the local uh, um, contracting offices for past um, contracts awarded, the pricing and stuff? 
Yep. Uh, so I know there's source selection information that's involved, so we can't necessarily provide everything that you're requesting, but you can very well submit your FOIA request um, to, and actually throughout our new organization, there's specific people that address just FOIA. So if you want to email me, I can get you the specific FOIA contact information and I can also provide it to Chuck so then he can distribute that as well. Because I, I do know that it would not come into your contracting office because we essentially only provide our FOIA um, specialist with information once she comes to us and says, hey, we have a request for this, provide, you know, X, Y, Z. Um, but do know through the FOIA request, there's limited information, um, especially it's source selection information that we cannot disclose and we cannot release. But the things that we can release, well, we could be sure to respond to that FOIA request. So for now, if you wouldn't mind just emailing that to me and then I can get you that information, that would be appreciated. Thank you. That Thank you. Jason White here. Um, I also asked a question in, in the chat, but to follow on to that, would, would that information be any different than what you could find in beta.sam just by searching by a, a, a NAICS code or a department for past contracts that were awarded? Because so, it gives so, a price awarded, right? I'm, sorry, I'm just wondering if you would get more information through a FOIA request or would it be worth the time or just to go into beta.sam and pull up, you know, the last year's worth of contract? So or, it, it depends on a FOIA request. If there's a specific project that you're looking into, a FOIA request would be helpful um, because then you would have the project name, you'd have the solicitation number, you would have all that information and you would basically say, okay, this is the project I'm seeking this information. But if it is um, in broad where it's just one specific industry, like a NICS code that you're, you're interested in knowing what was paid under that specific NICS code, then I would recommend there's either Beta SAM is one way, um, um, but there's also the FPDSNG. And so, Chuck, I don't know if that's um, a website that you have shared with your clients, but the acronym, um, yeah, FPDSNG.gov, anyone can get access uh, to that website. And me, as a, as a government buyer, I have access to it. That's required of me to report into that. So every um, warranted official... Um, that has authority to spend appropriated money has to report any appropriated funds that they spend in FPDSNG. So my recommendation would be to um, not only utilize beta because beta SAM, that's also required, but keep in mind that we post award our award decisions for anything greater than $25,000 um, for projects. So FPDS, you might capture the whole in entire industry that you're trying to target versus just those projects that are posted on beta SAM, if that makes sense. So I guess I hate to answer questions like it depends, but in this situation, it depends. Like a FOIA request, I would recommend if you have a specific contract that you, that you were interested in, you were not selected as the person that was awarded, but you're curious as to how many responses received or whatever information that you're wanting to get, um, very well submit a FOIA because then we can get specific into that request um, with project name, solicitation number, things like that. But if it's in broad, you know, in, in a very broad industry, like um, one of our biggest one in, in the Forest Service is the 115310 NICS code. And that NICS code is targeting the whole entire forestry where, you know, I don't know how specific you want to get into um, but FPDS even goes into that further where they'll provide you the NICS code, they'll provide you the product service code. So then you can get even more specific into what we are purchasing. And Amelia, if I can add to that, uh, this is Chuck. Uh, Jason, if you'd like to get with your uh, PTAC uh, regional manager, he or she will be able to pull data from that federal procurement data systems, next generation system, and perhaps also USA spending and provide you with uh, the information you might need. Yeah, FPDS is the one that I mentioned specifically because that is required for us to do all of our reporting in, whether you're in the Forest Service or not, it's federal wide. So that was my recommendation. Thanks. My question in chat was directed toward, uh, so I've, I'm retiring in about, well, August 1st, I'll be officially retired my last day in uniform be April 30th. So after 25 yeah. years in the Army, I've decided to grow up and get a real job. And so... 
my wife and I met in Korea. She got out after about 10 years. Um, and then she went to work for Deloitte Consulting as a federal consultant on the federal side. Mm-hmm. And then she went from there at Hill Air Force Base to a civilian. And then now she's decided to get her MBA and we've decided to start a government contracting company. So my question was, even though we have over 30 years of experience, can you kind of add on or go a little bit further into, you know, if you're if you're starting up a business and you you have a job while you're trying to get started, right? So I'm trying not to wait until we both are completely done uh, to start it. You know, as far as the service and supply lines of, you know, kind of working in that area is what we're going to target. You know, is there any approach that you've seen that's successful to kind of get started? And I know, you know, you said not to leave the area blank on past performance. I mean, I, I guess I would rely heavily on the fact that I've, you know, 25 years of operational experience and, and my wife has her PMP, so she's a project manager experience, but we haven't actually had a contract yet. <laughs> so, yeah. you know, is that, do you aim at the, I, I would think we maybe aim at maybe some of the smaller contracts first, you know, and just try to just basically just try to get our foot in the door to show that we can get the job done. But, you know, I just wanted to see if you could expand on that. I doubt I'm the only one in the, you know, it's kind of like credit. You can't get it. You can't get credit because you don't have credit. Well, how are you supposed to get credit? <laughs> so yeah. I feel like this is the same way. Like you, you have to have past experience, but how are you supposed to get past experience if you can't get the experience? So. Very good question. And I just want to remind everybody that um, we uh, no rating or a non-responsive non-responsive rating is better um, or not as good as a neutral rating. So that's why I was saying at least acknowledge that, okay, our this is our history. These are the things that we can do. These are, this is the past performance I do have, even if it's not you know aligning with the solicitation because you have options there. And that's why I recommend at least saying, look, we have no, we have no past performance because at least you're addressing the valuation factor. At least you are saying and letting that contracting officer know we don't have specific past performance to what you're looking for from your solicitation. Here's what we do have. And you very well can say our company is prepared to do X, Y, Z in order to fulfill this need that you guys have. And so convincing that contracting officer that you may not have that past performance, um, but here's how you guys can fulfill it, showing that you not only understand the requirement, you're addressing all evaluation factors, even if you don't have that. Because again, that will give you that neutral rating versus that non-responsive rating. Um, so that's the biggest thing I want everyone to take into consideration is the difference between the two, because not even addressing evaluation factor as simple as past performance could, could make it or break it. Um, so the evaluation team, the actual voting members, as soon as we you know, put an evaluation team together, those are the things that they look at first is, did he respond to the evaluation criteria? As a contracting officer, honestly, I don't even put any of the proposals that we receive. If they didn't address all evaluation factors, I don't even spend my engineer's time or my architect's time on it. I just, I completely remove it. And so then you're not only non-responsive, but then you're not considered further. So I very, I very well ensure that those evaluation criteria are addressed. And if they are not, they're not considered further. So I would very highly recommend um, to ensure that you're at least addressing every evaluation factor. And I think your guys' resume is already impressive as it is, the experience that you guys have, you know, putting that information out there, letting your contracting officer know where you guys actually did come from, the experience that you do have, because it is valuable. So I, that's, that would be a recommendation of mine. Yes, Justin. I just wanted to jump in on that real quick. Um, yeah. For past performance, can you use private industry projects as a past performance if they tie in significantly to the project that you're going after? Yeah, yeah. There's nothing in the regulations in our federal acquisition regulations that prohibit a contracting officer to award a contract to you guys as a small business if you have experience. Experience is experience, whether it's government or not. There could be some federal agencies or some solicitations that are written that, like I think Department of um, Defense, there are some federal agencies um, that I've seen um, that can say, we only want your DOD uh, experience in the Forest Service. But again, that's a discretion of, that's a, that is a decision that a contracting officer makes. So that is solely up to the contracting officer if they want to 
um, minimize their responses um, that they receive by saying that because they may be excluding a lot of small businesses that don't have DOD experience, but yet they may need that for their project. I guess it just, for me as a contracting officer, I've never um, put that in there to say, I only want to see your federal work. I, I just want to see you, you can get boots on the ground and get it done. Well, thank you. Yep. Amelia, can you address this? Uh, that goes to Jason's point. Um, where he's had, if an individual's had, um, you know, related experience in a, in another job or another organization, Jason mentioned that his wife had some, I think, project management experience, mm -hmm. uh, but now they've started their own business. Can they pull that type of experience that they've had in the past forward to this, uh, uh proposal? So in a very broad way they can say I served as a project manager for this many years I've done this and this I know that there are some companies especially if you work for um, another federal agency in the past that they may restrict you from using um, like their their business name or specific things like that um, so my recommendation is if you have experience listed on there and, and then consider what you can and can't do with whatever agreement of the previous employer that you've had, because I know that there are, it gets kind of sticky there. So my recommendation is at least let us know what your experience is. You, you know, you don't necessarily have to say company name. It's just the, the title, the, the actual experience that we're looking at. And, and if our evaluation team says, you know what, actually we do want to see all that, you'll see that as an as a in the valuation criteria, you'll say, you'll see that they want company name, they want the number of years, the type of work that you've done. You'll see it's kind of like a resume that you're building up, and they they essentially want to see the specifics. Um, but as long as you guys are taking the valuation factors for what they are in the solicitation, um, and you're at least addressing them and convincing us that you guys can do it, I I don't see anything in our federal acquisition regulations that would prohibit you guys from, um, you know, or even say that you guys are not qualified to do so, that you guys are not um, capable of doing it. And uh, I always like, even if my contractors don't um, submit a briefing, um, there's times where I've reached out to contractors to say, look, you weren't our low. Um, it was a really good proposal. And we were actually going to consider you, but because of X, Y, Z, if I see it's like minor things that I feel like just, they need to know that it was just something so minor that I would have selected them, but the, you know, to kind of help them in the future, because that's the whole intent of a briefing is to ensure that you are prepared for the next one to know what you did wrong, why you were not selected. Um, so briefings are always very educational as well. And something that I recommend um, it's it. And you have only, uh, three days to actually request for that briefing. So make sure that that you guys are are requesting that if not awarded. Could I just add and just may clarify what you were talking about, Chuck, that you can make a differentiation between experience and past performance. So you can have past performance that meets the criteria that they're asking for, but you can also take and weave your experience into your narrative. So if it's, if it, if it doesn't meet the criteria to, to uh, submit as past performance, but you have experiences like a project manager or program manager in, and, and can weave that into the narrative, then you, that's a way of differentiating it. Yeah, and you guys will see in the solicitations, there's a big difference between experience and past performance. You guys will see that. Um, they are treated as two different evaluation factors. So make sure that you guys, um, yeah, that you guys are addressing the valuation factors separately because past performance is one thing, experience is another. Um, past performance is the evaluation factor that we can choose to uh, rate you neutral, that we cannot say, oh, he doesn't have past performance, he's completely eliminated. Evaluation, um, the evaluation is all depending on that evaluation team and that evaluation criteria. We cannot go outside of what we listed in that solicitation. We have to only evaluate our contractors based on what's in that solicitation. So thank you for that. That was a very good point. So yeah, I hope that that's, if I'm not answering your guys' questions, please let me know.
<laughs> Other questions for Amelia? This is your opportunity. Dean Morton asked a question in the chat. He says, Amelia, will you be the contract office for the GAOA funds? So I will be, there's two of us currently in Intermountain Zone um, covering Idaho, Utah, Wyoming. So we have me and Karen um, Morthland on the Utah side. So if it's just the state of Utah that you're wondering, yes, I will be the contracting officer for the construction and architect and engineering type contracts. If you are looking for the service and supply, it could be, there's actually a bigger group of contracting officers that are, um, so I, I guess whoever's asking that question, if you wanna make sure that you utilize these um, email addresses that are on the screen, depending on what type of work you're looking for. Um, but yes, I will be one of the contracting officers for construction and A&E. got another question from the chat. We are a metal fabricator for Utah, Idaho, Nevada, and Wyoming areas. Are there ever a need for metal fabrication? Yep. Yeah, wouldn't, I'm, I believe that that covers um, guardrails. Uh, there's a, a lot of different things throughout the forest um, supplies. So I guess it depends on what you actually supply. So my recommendation, because we have, um, even there's times where we've needed things welded. Um, if you even have the equipment that you could potentially provide a service, I would, I would definitely reach out to your local district offices, give them your capability statement, let them know what you're capable of, of doing. Um, and, and yeah, and let it go from there. Because again, as long as they know that you're out there and they know the need that you have, um, they very well would be the one to provide us with your information. Because I, I conduct my own market research once I receive a contracting package from the district office or from the supervisor office, um, but it is good to see that they they've also um, know of the locals too. So that would be my recommendation. And I'm now just seeing the chat. I'm so sorry, guys. I I think we're caught up all to the last three or four. I think it said, do you also cover Nevada? Yep. Yes, exactly. Yep. And then, um, okay, I've been awarded supply contracts and limited time service contracts. Does that cause the contracting officer to, con to consider an offer more strongly in that area from the company in the future? Or to create a list of contractor to contact? Okay, so um, is the capability statement used as an evaluation criteria? or to create a list of contractors. So um, the first question was talking about does, <clears throat> you know, if you've been awarded a supply contract and limited time service contract, does that cause the contracting officer to, um, to consider uh, more strongly in that area for the company? So I, I think what they're asking there is, yeah, does that influence the contracting officer <clears throat> if you've already been awarded a supply contract and a service contract. If I'm reading that that question wrong, please let me know. But um, that it does not, the, the contracting officer very well is going to consider any information that you provide regarding previous contracts that you've been awarded or previous um, work that you've been, you've been awarded. Um, so yeah, they very well do consider um, any prior work that you've done and is the capable statement. So your capability statement generally is not an evaluation criteria. Evaluation criteria is generally created based off of the project itself. Um, so we work with our engineers to get a list of um, different things that they're wanting to see from you guys. So our engineers may ask um, or our our boots on the ground may ask, hey, I just want to know the complexity of this project isn't that much. Um, I just want to know what, what work they've done in the past. So I just want to see their experience. Or I want to know that they've worked on something like this within the last three years because something in the industry has changed within the last three years. So they want to know how much um, 
past performance you actually have in the industry within the last three years. So we very well um, adjust our evaluation criteria based off of the solicitation that we are writing. Um, <clears throat> so yeah, do know capability statement is basically you showing us or telling us what you're capable of doing, that you're saying I can provide X, Y, and Z, um, and, and you can provide us the capability statement in response to a solicitation, but I very well recommend um, adjusting your write-up um, based off of what the solicitation is asking for. Capability statements in the past, we have had um, where we had actual procurement technicians that um, would gather all that information. So for projects less than 15,000 where we don't have to publicize it. We don't have to go, you know, put it out there for national um, attention where we can just only solicit it to three vendors because anything less than $15,000, we can go to three local vendors and call that our competition. Um, so do know that you very well can, um, you know, let your capability statements, um, and, and again, that's why I'm recommending going to the district offices or to your local national forest office and at least provide them your capability statement because they would then know that your services are out there. They know what you're capable of doing and they would say, hey, they're right in our backyard. So very well um, provide that capability statement before you respond to a solicitation is, is what I would recommend. Um, and, and generally we don't have that as an evaluation um, factor. So do you look at companies' websites um, and should we have a company website? So generally when I'm doing my own um, review of the contractors, um, there, I basically go kind of into our reports that we can generate um, off of, there's there's actually quite a few of different websites that we can generate reports regarding like the finance part of the, the company or the, the years of service or things like that. But um, it's very rare that I go to the actual company website because I want to see that they're addressing this specific solicitation in their proposal. I wanna see what you can do for that specific project. And so for that reason, it's good to see how many years of service you've had, the kind of work that you've done. So company website, you know, if, if you feel like that's in your best interest as a company that you can advertise it better um, on a website that they're, you know, you can reach a broader um, customer port, you know, uh, you can, you can get more attention off your website, then I would, I would very well, you know, proceed with doing that. Um, our evaluation uh, team generally is put in a room. Um, I only give them copies of the proposal and a copy of the solicitation. And that's all that they see. Um, if they want to go further and go into, you know, who is this guy really? I wanna know more about him, I'm curious. You know, they very well can go beyond that. Um, but we kind of want to keep our guys focused on just what the solicitation says and focused on that one proposal. And we don't want kind of outside uh, noise. I, I That's why I like to have them just focused on how well did they respond to that solicitation? Their company is great. And if you want to see their website, yeah, go for it. But how well did they respond to that solicitation? So, you know, I guess I hate to answer questions again like this, but it depends. That that company website is definitely, um, as business owners, up to you guys if you feel like that would be in your business's um, best interest. For me as a contracting officer, like I said, my focus and my evaluation team's focus is regarding that specific proposal in response to the solicitation. So thank you so much for those questions. I'm hoping that I didn't miss any others because I finally, I'm just now realizing, yeah, playing with Zoom and pulled up the chat box. Any other questions for Amelia? Okay, um, going once, going twice. <laughs> Thank you, everyone. Very good questions. And uh, Amelia, um, you uh, you are uh, intelligent and articulate, and you have done a very good job of uh, giving everyone some very sound advice, not only on the opportunities with the Forest Service, but how to um, you know how 
what what they need to do as they look at a proposal and, and submit on that. I heard a couple of things that I hope people picked up on. One was that opportunities that are within uh, the 15 to $25,000 range that are not going to be put on the contracting opportunities page of beta.sam.gov will be posted on the Forest Service's website. So be, so be sure you go there. Secondly, uh, Amelia also talked about um, um, the contacts for the different industries and to go to your local uh, dispatch or district office of the Forest Service. And that, that includes right here in uh, Utah. Mm -hmm. So uh, with that, uh, Amelia, th uh, Amelia, thank you. Uh, you by the way, she, she reached out to us, and, and I'm so glad you did. Uh, feel free to use the, the Utah PTAC for any time that the Forest Service needs uh, uh, needs outreaches or needs to, uh, any type of contact information. Uh, we are certainly here for you. And, and one of these days, we look forward to maybe having you down to Utah for our PTAC symposium where you exhibitor so that uh, that invitation will be open to you in the near future. Thank you, Amelia. I appreciate the opportunity. Thank you. Mark. And that's one of the reasons I want everyone on this call to know I, I did reach out to the Utah PTAC because I know they are such a good resource. I've always worked with the ones in Utah and Wyoming, and I know that PTAC, their mission is, is amazing. Um, you guys are so awesome to work with. So I appreciate you letting, giving me the opportunity to talk to everyone. And I look forward to hearing from you guys. Thank you. And Idaho is lucky to have you. So thank you. Uh, to our clients and again to those uh, small businesses that uh, have joined us, uh, I want to remind you that our next outreach will be March um, March 16th at 9 a.m. And this will feature the, uh, uh, the University of Utah Purchasing Office as well as the Salt Lake County Purchasing Office. So this time, uh, we're focusing on state and local uh, opportunities, and we will have Randy Ruff, who's a, a purchasing manager with the University of Utah, as well as J Jason Yoakum, who is the purchasing director for Salt Lake County. And that email will be going out to you all very shortly uh, so that you can register. Again, there's, there's no fee to attend, uh, but registration will be required. So we will get that out to you shortly. And we wish Amelia and all of you a, a super day, and we'll see you on March 16th. Thank you. Thank you, guys.